too near My fist no thrill It's worse than nil So draw the right conclusion Let them be still Welcome to episode 72 of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast showcasing the wide range of perspectives and ideas throughout antinatalism as it exists today, through interviews with antinatalist and non-antinatalist thinkers and creators of all kinds. Now running four years strong, I'm your host, Amanda Suganik, and today I'm speaking with Professor of Communication Studies at Grand Valley State University, Vice President of the Institute of General Semantics, past President of the Media Ecology Association, and a Fellow of the General Communicology Institute, an award-winning teacher and author of several books including How Non- being haunts being and legendary YouTube philosopher Professor Corey Anton. Welcome to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, Corey. Thank you so much for having me here, man. It's it's an honor and a treat and a delight. It's good to see you again. I haven't you know seen you on the tubes for a while, and I haven't been there either. So yeah. it's fun to connect this way. And so what's what's the topic here today? What what are we gonna what will we address? Yes, well, so the topic is uh, your work, uh, our, our hi the history of antinatalism on YouTube and your place within it. Um, I've prepared so much today. Uh, you know, Professor Anton, on my channel, I can't tell you how long I I've, I've wanted to have a conversation with you. And I, 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 I genuinely feel like I almost sort of missed my opportunity uh, about a decade ago because I wasn't really I wasn't really conversing with people just yet. I was a little, it took me a while to kind of get to a point where I was comfortable enough to do this kind of thing okay. uh, with participants of, of the YouTube community at that point. Um, so, you know, uh, way back when, when our now, unfortunately, long dead YouTube community was still active, um, you know, those were the days. <laughs> um, Corey, I don't know if you and I will agree on anything in relation to this topic today. Um, and that's more than fine. That's, uh, that's, Incidentally, part of why I think our conversation today is so important. Um, though you may not be fully aware of it, actually, you were a tremendously significant character in the development of the antinatalist community between the years of 2010 through around 2015, which was really the first true antinatalist community. I would and, and, and have argued. Um, you were an extremely active and extremely valuable participant on the other side of the argument, arguing against antinatalism. And you had some hot takes back, back then, and we'll talk about those soon enough. Um, we'll also talk uh, a little bit about your, I hope your most recent book, How Non-Being Haunts Being. Um, but one of the biggest points I want to make by having this interview today is to say that you represent not only an important piece of early antinatalist internet history, but a piece of what the movement has, in my opinion, lost and a piece that it sorely needs. And that's really engaging pushback, you know, from the other side of, of the argument. Uh, we, we, we had that from you and from others back in the day in a really big way, and, and I'm grateful for every bit of it. But I also want to make the point that this is a big thing that I think the media itself has lost, you know, once the, the, the response video culture kind of died. Philosophical debate on YouTube yeah. um, really suffered as a result of that. It just, it just isn't what it used to be. Um, so I'm excited to remember, you know, all those times with you today. Um, I'm so excited to, to speak with you about so many things today. Um, but before we get into it, just the most basic of questions first, who is Professor Corey Anton? Oh, good grief. That's too much. I don't know about any kind of questions like that. I, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm a professor at Grand Valley. I've been a professor here since 98. I have degrees in psychology and communication and philosophy. So I'm, I'm a little bit multidisciplinary in that sense. I'm, I'm somewhat homeless. I'm a little too philosophical for some of my calm colleagues. I'm not philosophical enough for some of my, you know, philosophers. I'm, I'm, and I, I like a lot of interdisciplinary stuff. So I'm, I'm in that sense, not really easily, easily camped. I guess I, I would rather, I, I mean, I just want to maybe open by saying, I'm not sure if there's a, a, a tight correspondence between how I see myself related to antinatalism and how I heard it just sort of being depicted. Because I don't think of myself as on the other side of antinatalism. I think of things like pro-life, people who are pro-life to me are the people who are both most anti-natalist anti 
and like the, the people who carry the pro-life you know position and i think a lot of those people they're not even interested in willing and to discuss it with the anti natalist so in some you know in, in that sense i i would more characterize myself as someone who's taken anti-natalism quite seriously and i do believe that for those who are pro-lifers anti-natalism is an absolutely crucial dialogue to get into that people who are pro you know so it's it's where you stand on the spectrum i mean again to me who's someone who's a pro-lifer there i'm more inclined to bring out the virtues the arguments that need to be heard from the anti-natalist camp but i would describe myself as not an anti-natalist but i'm not necessarily maybe against antinatalism in the way that I am against pro-life. So if I, if I say I'm against the pro-life argument, but I'm not like against the antinatalist argument in the same way, it's to a lesser extent, and it has to do for all kinds of reasons. Um, I mean, I think, so yeah, I mean, I think that would be the first thing I'd want to say, that there's a bunch of religious dogma and I, I think unwanted pregnancies are something that's really horrible. It's horrible for the person who's enduring it. It's also horrible for the person who has been brought into the world basically unwanted. I mean, I, I grew up, I was adopted, okay? And I was adopted at five weeks. And I think it's a great risk. You know, my biological mother, you know, she risked bringing me into existence and she kind of put me in a basket, a, a, I guess a well taken care of basket, but a basket pushed me up a river. It was a closed adoption case. It was meant out of love and care. And I think from her perspective, she did it for, you know, for many reasons. You know, it isn't just like adherence to religious dogma. I think there is no other way to enter life short of having someone else make the decision for you. And so this, let me see. I mean, I, I, maybe then I'll say just a couple more things and then maybe we can go back and forth. But, but I mean, I think here would be where I would say that there, there are two things that I'd want to say and get off right off the bat. The first, that is, I don't believe that life is either good or bad. I think it's ambiguous. I think that we couldn't, even if we spent hours going at it, we couldn't give all of the good things and all of the bad things and then summatively go, okay, I dotted the I, crossed the T, what is it equal? It's not, somehow not able to be summed up as qualitatively just either good or bad. It's somehow both. And I think part of the difficulty is that to different people can experience that ambiguity pessimistically or optimistically Part of the difficulty of some of the early YouTube arguments that I was in is that people, they would often say something like this, that the reason someone can't see that life is futile suffering and there's no point to it is that they're in a defense mechanism clinging to life. They already have like the sunk cost of an investment in their existence, and now they can't critically think about it because that's too psychologically painful. The problem with that argument, the problem with that argument is that that's just as equally uh, applicable to anyone who gives the antinatalist position. Somebody accuses them of being a, a basement dwelling troglodyte who's just bitter and sad that their own life has not amounted to that much. And so now they thinking that they can speak for other people, even people who say, look, you don't understand what my life is like. They say, no, look, I'll tell you what your life has to be. Your life has to be adherence to the things that I say, which is life is crap. Or something like this. See, I think the pro so again, the, the first point would be that those who claim that uh, it's not being taken seriously are doing out of a psychological defense mechanism that equally applies to both positions and it washes. Now, here's where I think the antinatalist gets most difficult, and I'll stop with, with this statement right here. And that would be, and I, maybe I want to get I want to get further up to get to where I'd like us to go, where I think maybe we could meet minds about the right to die. To me, the, the, the changing the culture with giving people the right to die may be the place where I could really come and go. All right, let's be buddies. We're on the same page. But here would be where I would say antinatalism is deeply out of touch with most people's sensibilities. And it's easy to demonstrate. 
If I say we we have a simple example and all the information we have is we have there was an old person, 80 years old, got killed in a car accident today. I say there was a young person, a five year old, got killed in a car accident today. We don't know anything about these people. Most people are going to hear that and they're going to go, the death of the five year old is more tragic, more painful, and more of a loss. If, on the other hand, they were to say, phew, thank God that five-year-old got killed right there because there just would have been nothing but a life of suffering and loss and pain and hardship. So it really was better off. It would have been a better thing for the five-year-old to have died than the eight-year-old. When that happens, when people's spontaneous reaction is, yes, it's preferable to have a five-year-old get hit in the car accident than an eight-year-old, then I'll think, antinatalism is at least closely aligned with what would be called common sense and would have like promise. But until then, it's just not going to resonate. It's too tough of a sell. Well, I don't think that's really what antinatalism would be saying, though, in that in either circumstance. It's not that the 80 year old was better off dead or the five year old is better off dead. It's both were better never to have existed in the first place, that the decision for them should never have been made in the first place. Well, I mean, my, I, I would disagree, and I would say that you're you're right in a philosophical way, but the point of this whole argument is about the moral imperative not to procreate. Well, but I, I think that breaks, brings me right back to what I just said. I mean, it, it, the fact of the matter is, in procreating, you create circumstances in which five-year-olds and 80-year-olds die. Oh, no, Amanda, that's not right, because what you're saying is that the reason you're claiming you have the moral imperative not to procreate is because there's more suffering than benefit. But the fact that people's sensibilities are so different show that your argument seems deeply misinformed or at least out of alignment with other people. And if you say, well, they're just psychologically rationalizing. No, I just showed that that's not the move you can make. Well, I, I don't I, I don't know that I make that argument that they're psychologically rationalizing. I don't think most people have thought about this subject to begin with. It's information okay. that people generally haven't been haven't been presented with. Sure. So, you know, I think part that's part of the point I've, I've been trying to make at the very beginning is that this whole conversation, despite the fact that antinatalism is an ancient idea, it's been with us in one form or another since antiquity. It's really only been uh since 2006 that this is even a word <laughs> and it's not a word that's even in the english dictionary yet so people have not been confronted with these um these ideas for very long particularly i, mean, I don't know if they're see to, to say that it's always been here but there hasn't been a word for it i mean i think we could say that that's true but also not true i think in some cultures they had a different sense they had a notion that a child wasn't part of the culture until the parents, the person who had given birth to it, had decided whether or not it was a cultural member. And so exposing babies was a practice. Up until the rise of the state, people could sell their children to slavery. They could beat their kids senseless. You could kill your kid. And it was your right. I mean, and that, it, so that's one of these, you know, like, like the ways that libertarianism gets misrepresented as sort of like the individual against the collective. In some way, like the government and the collective, particularly the uh, governmental agencies, they were like a rallying power point between the tyranny of the family and the individual. Do you know what I mean? But uh, that, that, that's neither here nor there. I guess what I'm just trying to say is that what, what I would like to hear is how exactly, if, if it's true that if we just pull your average person, not you or other antinatalists, but if we just go on the street and go in, people have never heard of antinatalism. And we give them the story, an 80 year, we don't know any other facts about the people, but just all we know is it's an 80 year old person and it's a five year old, which is the more tragic death. I think most people. But that's I think, also not the subject. That's not what antinatalism is about. <laughs> Well, it's, it's essential to your argument because the argument of antinatalism is that in order to give the warrant not to procreate, you have to show that life itself is not worth living and not worth continuing. Well, but it's about but 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 the, but the not continuing part is important, yes. But it's it has to begin with whether you create the life in the first place. That's the question. So it's not that it's not which is more tragic. 
and what the common man on the street's yeah. opinion of that would be. It's but whether what, you start circumstances to begin with. It's what you whether you it's whether you it is right for you to create need for no need, whether it's right for you to create a circumstance in in which a person would have to make a decision whether it's worth it or not. I mean, we'll talk about, about this more later, but I mean, you, you know, in some of your older videos, you talk a lot about how um, you know, by 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 putting antinatalism out in the world, you're taking the choice away from somebody who would have existed. And it should be that person's choice to decide whether life is an imposition or not. But I mean, you know, you, you can't leave that to like for oh, when the person yeah. still, you know, is, is actually in existence already. I think though you're, you're not, why do you think, you're, I mean, just why do you seem unwilling to just answer that very simple question? Well, wh what, wh which would be more tragic? Yeah. No, no, no. Now, I'm not saying what do you think is more tragic. As an antinatalist, you, of course, think it's more tragic that anyone's existing. That there's no way to compare it. It's just all equally somehow horrible. Yeah. I think that doesn't make any sense. Why doesn't it make any sense? Why doesn't it make any sense? Because that, that's that's the core. That's to me anyway. That's the core of the subject. If all lives are equally bad. That all it's that that all procreation <laughs> puts, I mean, that all procreation unnecessarily puts sentient creatures in harm's way. That's I, that is that is a risk. Right. I mean and you're doing so without consent. And you're, you're creating an imposition uh, on that living thing. Give consent. I mean, using the word consent is like. Do you do you believe? No, no. But but the you nature said, of consent you is that if you can't doing, get it, you shouldn't impose it. When you say you're doing it without consent, you're introducing a category mistake because you're making it seem like there's a person there who could give it. Yeah, I'm consent. saying that because there is. Well, do you believe in a year from now? Will there be a 2024? Will there be? I guess I'm acting as if there will be. I, so there I, will be new people there. People that are not even conceived yet will exist in 2024. So we can't get their consent. It's an impossibility. Then why would we take it? If you can't get a consent to have sex with somebody because they're asleep or they're, they're you know, then you don't do it. You just don't do it. The nature of consent Ooh, is if you can't you get it, then you don't Lord impose it. Someone who's alive and asleep, that's someone who's there who you can fail to get consent from because they potentially, if awake, could give consent. But but you, but you don't take that consent unless you have it explicitly. There right? may be some people who, after they've come into being, they look at their parents and go, although I couldn't have given consent, I'm glad I did and I now give it to you. What do you well, say? That's that? Well, that's true, but how many people are is 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 that the per for every person that it would give their consent after the fact? How many people are we dragging along that would say yes, it was an imposition? Okay. So you can't have you can't have all of these good lives without also it fostering all of this bad. Now I know for a fact, based on quotes from your videos, that you believe that it's it's. One, very, very difficult to imagine life existing without the cost, but you think that it's a cost worth paying. And I don't. That's what the antinatalist is saying. It is not worth the cost. It is not worth the expense of all of these bad experiences to start life. But what you're doing is you're basically saying that those people who first they there's no way to get into existence without some other person making that decision for you right. without Right. There's no way to happen. Right. That's, right. Not, none of us choose to come into existence. Right. Another person makes a choice. They make that choice because their sense is that their life has been more good than bad. Now you could give no, you could again. We could give all kinds of reasons. There are some people who do. They they get unwanted. You know, they have an un, uh, intended unwanted pregnancy. There's religious dogma. There's fear. There's all kinds of other things that go on there. But I think to say that the only people who have children are those people who are just willingly taking risks for others. I think well, no. What I don't know what else you would call it. Responsibility. Corey of trying to give another person experiences that they have cherished 
so much that they want they they know that they will they know that they will die and they think they're conferring a benefit on someone who couldn't speak on their own behalf and then they're trusting and maybe this is a founder trust but you'd have to address this question they're trusting that the person once born could say i now am in a position to give you consent and this is where i go back to where we would to me, the rational move is to talk about the right to die because you don't get in. You don't get the choice of coming into existence. No one asks you. It has to be, quotes, imposed. It's actually the decision has to be made by other people because you're not there to make it. But I think that means that the one choice that every person upon legal adulthood should have is the right to die. We should have institutions. We should have various it, whether it requires, you know, a, a statement of sanity and a letter, and it's something like you have your friends and your family, and you have several people, whoever it is, sign off on it, and you go somewhere and you say, you know, it's not goodbye, cruel world. It's like, all right, I've had what I've wanted, I've experienced it, and I'm out. Yeah, but it's a little callous, isn't it, Corey? Why? Why? I mean, I understand that you think. That, I mean, I understand that a lot of people who procreate have really good intentions. The road to hell is paved with really good intentions. I'm not doubting that those people have good intentions, but to say that it isn't a risk, to say that it isn't imposition, and to say, to take the to take the need for meaning, the need for love, the need for family, and to impose need for no need just to have that, just to bring that into the I mean, what I mean, an example of yourself, if you don't mind me saying, I mean, what why why wouldn't you give that to somebody already here? Why would you need to create a new being in order to? I personally would say there's a huge difference between something like the and, and see this this is where I I feel like it's sort of like this the pro lifer has the stick bent really over here the anti natalist has the stick bent over here I'm sort of it's like this I I know you, you think it's two I, I extremes think, I think life is more ambiguous than your position is advocating you you're making it seem like all said and done the words used to describe it at their basal level have to have negative pejorative pessimistic undertones it lurks with these sort of ways in which and, and, and here's where I, I, you, I really, you, okay you say that Corey but you're the one telling Telling me that think, the need to create new life warrants the justification to create somebody who will then need to go and kill themselves. I mean, I agree with you about the right to die, but why should you have the right to create somebody that will then be in need of suicide? Don't you think that's a little bit callous and glib in the face of what people go through yeah, in their lives? You're being callous and glib in your reluctance to address the question of why most people find the death of a five-year-old more tragic than the death of a 30-year-old. Your inability to come clean on that question tells us everything we need to know, Amanda. I I, I don't think that that's the subject of antinatalism. I, I think, think that the death of five-year-olds is very, very, very tragic. I think the death of I think the death, I think that the people die sucks. I think you're wrong. Okay. So you think the 80 year old is more tragic? What, what, what is your way of answering this question? I think it's obvious that the death of the five year old is more tragic because life is more than suffering. It's okay, more. I, I mean, this is this. If uh, look, I you know I don't have a background in philosophy. I will say that. But I mean, this is deprivationalism is not the, is not the subject of antinatalism. So you're just changing the goalposts. There's even a need machine where need isn't there, and there's this asymmetry that's an oversimplification of the complexity. It's much more ambiguous. You're not just a need machine. You're something a lot other and more than that well what is it what what, what more are we it's beauty you're able to cry to music you're able to make a, a, a so what contribution so to what are you that's i mean you, i got meaning coming out of every pore okay i'm a toy collector i do all kinds i'm an artist i do all kinds of crazy stuff okay i got i got terrestrial meaning like you wouldn't believe okay so what it sounds so pretty good <laughs> Well, you you have a very trivial attitude towards the suffering of existence. You have a very trivial attitude towards it. it's 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 alive in every it's, single one of your videos on this subject. You think you read my uh, how non being haunts being? You think I'm yeah. in trivial about the suffering? You of are, and when it comes to creating life and what and the cost of that life, you're you are you are glib as to what the cost of that is. See, again, you use the word cost. It's it's funny. I mean, the, the words you're using are so interesting. Like, did you deserve any of this? No one deserves to be born. I mean, 
I, I begin with Amber. Deserve has nothing to do with anything. Ambrose Bierce's Devil Dictionary, where birth is the first and direst of all disasters. Life is a lot of suffering, hardship. No, life so is. Why impose it? Why make more of it? People want to kill themselves at 18. Life is absolutely horrible. I, and I agree. So not, why make more of it? <laughs> it's not just that. See, you're you're denying the ambiguity of it. You you acted like you can round well, it out. It's well, just imposition of a need machine. Well, and okay. Hardship. I I've never understood your mm -hmm. argument for ambiguity. Well, it's it's ambiguous. It's an ambiguous argument. What do you mean? I mean, I, 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 I mean, I can name every rotten things that happens that befalls sentient creatures, and you just label that as ambiguous. I've never understood that. I don't think it makes any sense. I think that you're being glib in underestimating how wondrous and deeply profound is the experience of being alive. And if you have purpose and real sense of relevance, many people can endure an, an incredible amounts of suffering. Because I'm not denying that. Isn't of meaning. I'm not denying that. But a lot of, but, 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 but for every person that can, you got a whole pile of people that can't. And also it's not just about people. It's about sentience. It's about animals. It's about nature. This whole game that life is caught up in has a huge fucking price tag attached to it. And okay. you're saying that because we can enjoy all we'll the see. lovely things we can love, we can have be uncles, we can be fathers, we can be all this stuff that somehow, you know, name your price. Any price is, it, well, what you're true. saying to me is that any price tag you want to put on that, so long as it comes with all this good stuff, I find this, for you to pay. Now you're totally changing. Antinatalism is philosophically respectably discussed by people like Benatar, not some of this goober stuff that's coming out of nowhere, like life itself. That, that, that to me is just absurd. What argument do you think he's making? You don't think that Benatar is a sentiocentric antinatalist? I think he's talking about humans who deliberate about the possibility of having children. I don't think he's advocating like this at the level of animals. I don't think he's- Yes, he is. Well, Maybe talking about spading and neutering, we're not talking about ending life. I don't know. I mean, he, I, you know, uh, David Benatar is not a red button. He's not, you know, exactly. I mean, there's there's arguments to autonomy mixed in with all of that. But yes, he's an extinctionist. I don't know how you wouldn't get that uh, an idea. I mean, there is non-extinctionist antinatalism. That is also a fact, but Benatar yeah. is an extinctionist antinatalist. I don't know what he would yeah, you know, you know I'm, decide I'm, to do or not necessarily, but that's another conversation. Interesting that you can't probably have any arguments at all with pro-lifers. I mean, you can have these kinds Why wouldn't of I have? Why wouldn't I have a, be able to have arguments with a pro-lifer? I don't know. I think they would just disagree with so much of this. I mean, I, at least I'm willing- I welcome it. Well, I'm, willing, I'm willing to agree that life is just- a lot of hardship, a lot of loss, a lot of suffering, and it's a lot of human stupidity and cruelty. It's not just the natural hardships of the world, the luck of the draw, the, the, the different forms of just ableism that some people are born with, all this kind of stuff. It's more that people through greed, stupidity, thoughtlessness, they we've created horrifying prison systems we have weak mental health facilities we don't have respectable right to die orientations in our culture i mean i think there's a lot of ways in which what you're calling those hardships that would make it justifiable to tell someone they can't impose life at all because it's a risk i mean to say that it's a risk and then say that although some people may end up with a life quotes better than it being all bad. So when you do the, the, the measure, you're going to put it on the weight and scale. And there's this few little percentage of people who when the balance goes, it was better than worse. But for the bulk of people, it's all bad. And then you say, well, because there were just only a few people who had it good, then you can't risk for anyone at all. I think for a lot of people, again, they go, I don't care. I, I Because people can't because I can't speak for myself and other people have to make the decision, a lot of people are going to go and take the risk. And by the fact that most people still say that the death of the five-year-old is more tragic than the death of the 80-year-old, most people go, I guess my life was actually pretty good. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, 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 just, I just failed to see that how in the face, most people would be saying that without any knowledge of antinatalism. I mean, if, they, right. if, if people have the 
that argument in mind, maybe they would say, hey, maybe it wasn't a good idea to create the five-year-old in the first place. And how exactly did that 80-year-old die? Did they have access to the right to die or did they die horribly? I mean, let me ask you this, Corey. Would you, we don't have the right to die in most places in the world. It's, not, it's non-existent. And, and even where we do, it's a constant battle. Let me take Canada for, for as an example right now. Um, would you put a moratorium on procreation until we do? Because right now, we're cool. pumping out life like crazy, and there's no way out other than, you know, cool. miserable circumstances. I mean, I prefer people such as yourself and other antinatalists to go out, stir trouble, create arguments, make people think about it. I think you should be advocating that people who are pro-life think about it. Not me. I'm not a pro-lifer. No, but, but Corey, you, my reasons for you, I mean, you've, you've, I don't you, you've act, you have actively been, I mean, you, and clearly this has been a topic on your mind for a long time. It did enter into how non-being haunts being. I mean, you did revisit it after 12 years of talking about it on YouTube. So I was talking about death acceptance before your group was even touching all this stuff. I've been on yeah, death acceptance I since that. I was a teenager. I understand that. I, I don't understand where we're getting confused here. I mean, you, 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 you were, you were. I, I, I haven't said anything untrue. You were an active participant in this conversation for years. You have some idea in your head that from some other people, I'm not sure where it comes from. Go find my videos. I'm not a pro-lifer. My I never head. said you were. I never said you were. I've never called you a natalist. I've never called you a pro-lifer. I've said that your ability to have a non-antinatalist conversation with antinatalists was valuable. That's all I've said. You're putting words in my mouth. Oh, Why can't good. you accept that? <laughs> I don't understand why we're getting angry at each other about this. You record, you're recording this right now. And yeah. we're going to do at the beginning telling people, that's how you introduced me as someone who's anti-antinatalist. No, I, I, I did not call you anti-antinatalist. Well, I don't think well, that at all. Well, it's on the recording right here. Do, do you, I mean, no, no, oh, please don't do not remove this now. Well, no, this, I'm not gonna I, I didn't say I was no. going to remove anything. I, I mean, I can go back and read what I wrote. I mean, it, it was all pre written. Like I'm saying, I find the antinatal personally, yeah, I find the antinatalist position very useful when confronting someone who's a pro lifer. Okay. That's what I want to in this discussion. Okay, but I, but again, I never called you an anti antinatalist. I simply, oh, I did say that you were on the other side of the argument, and you were you were on a different side of the argument. Okay, a different side of the argument. You were an antinatalist. I told you. Not only do I disagree with it, but I disagree with it less than I disagree with pro life. Fantastic. That's, not, I mean, I, 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 where are we getting confused here? You have a, a comb with one tooth in it. There, there's a lot of fines of shade grays in here. Corey, all I'm telling you is that your ability to have the conversation on a different side of the argument okay. than an antinatalist argument was right. valuable. Well, no, I appreciate it. And I think, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> wow. The stuff that you're doing, you know, again, to promote the, the thoughtless, pro to me, thoughtless procreation people who get googly eyed when they think of babies, people who do this sort of pan gloss, everything is rainbow and puppies. But just because we say, look, it's not all rainbows and puppies, that doesn't mean it's nothing but a useless need machine. I mean, they, those to me are equally absurd. The well, person who can say you, life you, is nothing. You bringing up rainbows and fresh, fresh baked bread, I remember that one from one of your videos, in the face of real suffering in the world, I'm, I'm having exactly the same reaction. I mean, you're telling me that I'm not appreciating the good stuff enough, but I'm I'm my critique is basically the same to you. You're not really taking the weight of the bad stuff enough. Can't you see the, uh, here's the asymmetry in the argument is that on my channel, I say it both ways. I have lots of videos about there is no happily ever after people. And I have a lot of videos that are basically talking about what does that mean and how are we to write, you know, fittingly respond to that. And uh -huh. it, it, it was very hard for me to have a channel because in some way on the theist atheist debate, I yeah. was too spiritual for any of the religious, you know, or any of the atheist people. Okay. But I'm yeah, right. Right. I know. I'm I'm in between those areas. I, I get it. I get it. I, look, I'm I'm not particularly categorizable either <laughs> in various ways. So I understand that that is a struggle. 
Um, well, you're sort of categorizing yourself blanketly and in a ground level way as an anti natalist how long, how long have you known me, Corey? Have we been talking? I don't think you know much about how I categorize myself. I am an antinatalist. I'm also many things. Okay, well, exactly. See, now, no, okay, that's an interesting comment. I think life can have a lot of different dimensions. Yes, and it can. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm. Our experiences are very, very, very valued, very varied. But what the antinatalist is saying is that the suffering is what has the most weight. If that, that were true, if that were true, well, I don't no, think you've proved that, proven that it isn't. All you need to do, all you need to do, is get at least fifty percent of the population. Just fifty percent, Amanda. Get, get, make this your task. Make it so that when we ask people blanketly if a fifty-year-old or an eighty-year-old and a five-year-old get hit in a car accident and they die, which is the more tragic? Which is the worst? Well, I will have one when they can say that neither should have been brought into existence. Not whether, not which, not which, not which is the deprivation. Dodging. That's not the. That's not the subject. Dodging the question. You're dodging you're not the understanding the subject. The answer to the question directly bears upon your claim that you have a legitimate warrant to say don't pre appropriate because there's more hardship than there is benefit. That's that's you have to be able to substantially demonstrate that life is somehow worse for, for that is it's better to have never been. That is that there is more loss than there is gain. If that's uh -huh. true. That, you need to prove that. Why, if that's true, is people's intuitive response to that question so out of alignment with what you're calling the truth here? Well, again, who, 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 very few people have been exposed to this. It is a difficult thing to understand. It does go against the grain of what people think about. Like, who, who's saying otherwise? I mean, obviously, if you get people together, they're not going to have an antinatalist perspective. Do you think I'm surprised by that? No. <laughs> It goes, I'll follow that up. Do you actually believe that if everyone suddenly heard this broadcast or anyone, if suddenly everyone heard the argument of antinatalism, suddenly they would change how they'd answer that no. question? No, of course not. Of course Are you sure? not. It's, it's a difficult thing to get people to understand. Okay. People haven't been at me. I also said to you at the beginning of this, that 2010 was the birth of the first antinatalist community. We haven't been doing this very long. It's a very difficult argument to make to humanity. So I, I, I in no way think that it's magic words or that we're just on the horizon of winning. I think it's a Sisyphusian effort that yeah. some of us have taken on, but I think, but we've taken it on for really good reason. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess I, in that sense, I'm a comrade in arms that, you know, I pay okay, great. I, I, I'm a, an allied to a robust, and again, for lack of a better word, I'm a, allied to a, a robust spirituality amidst full-on death acceptance. No happily ever after, no judgment, no miracles, no divine intervention, mm -hmm. but the same thing was just a fluke, that doesn't make any sense. To me, somehow, life's orderliness somehow wouldn't have been what it is without sentience emerging out of it. Like sentience makes sense to the orderliness that the cosmos is. What, tell me more about that. What do you mean by that? I think to, to try to imagine what the cosmos would be without sentience wouldn't be the cosmos at all. The cosmos, as it could be understood, would be one that included knowing of it as part of its possibilities. Well, I mean, without sentience, I mean, there's nobody. There, yes, it's just a raw, violent universe. So it does. Right. There's not even that. There's just many, many. Right. I mean, it's what the Buddhists would say. Yeah, there's just, you know, you, you can't even talk about it. And so, again, I. I'm, well, it sounds great to me. There's nothing suffering without sentience. So that's kind of what I'm going for. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't I don't see how it's impossible to talk well, about. See, there's nothing suffering. That's that's the sole criteria of existence is whether or not there's suffering. I have never said that there isn't all kinds of variation to existence. But what I have said is that the suffering is the most weight and the, and that weight gets bought by by procreation, an act that I understand has all of this meaning for people, why can't people find their meaning doing something else that doesn't implicate something that's going to suffer? Because Amanda, again, okay, I, I, let's try to get clear. Again, I think you're, yes, I mean, I don't have children. I understand. I think there, there are a lot of 
ways that people can live life. Look, let's just, and I do this in the book. I mean, suddenly imagine by fiat, this video goes viral. Every person on the planet hears it and goes, I think this, this woman here is right. You know, time is to stop the madness, stop the crazy train, put on the brakes. I have no expectation of that. Those people would be dangerous to themselves because they wouldn't know who they are. Intergenerationality is part of the very fabric of being. Well, we so can't... is slavery, Corey. I mean, all, all kinds of things. Have been, I mean, eating meat is a core part of our culture and identity. I mean, these things get, you know, people do, I mean, what is, you know, people do realize. Well, sorry, go ahead. You're being very glib in trying to compare vegetarian and meat eating to intergenerationality. Intergenerationality is the fabric of anything that multicellular organisms, particularly animals, mammals, not all of them have to eat either kinds of, you know, the, 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 the dietary well, restrictions are I mean, very different. That I'm just saying that this is a profound uh, it's an ontological fact that each of us come into the world by coming out of another person and there's no way to come in short of another person making the choice for you. Yeah, Why well, you well, you've said in past videos that because we have that biological ability that it gives us some kind of license to do it. Do you still believe that? Um, ontologically, of course. Okay. That so is because, because I have... I'm, I'm using one of Amendment's arguments now because I have a fist. Or you have a fist. Does that give you the right to throw it so any way you choose? No, the point is that there is a biological inscription of a kind of fecundity that's outside of an individual's like capacity. Some people want to have children and can't. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm just saying just because we can do something doesn't make it right. I mean... It, you're, you're confusing very categorically different things. Like if I, if somebody punches me, say you punch me, whatever. Like there's an actual like fist, like violence. There's like, like a thing there, but the like it's not like it, you can punch me and then it, it doesn't work or something. People can have sex unsuccessfully. Either one of them could be infertile. Well, when you procreate, the thing is still gonna die. I mean, there's there's not there's not there's not like there's no, there's no expectation that in the future it's going to suffer. It's going to suffer. Yes. There is an inevitability of suffering that is it's just as real as getting punched in the damn face. There's an entire section. I mean, there's a whole section in my book called Birth is a Death Sentence. To yeah. give birth is to give someone a sentence to death. That's right. Look, what do you want? You want to be able to experience love and take all the hardships. You want to experience all the sense of love. But in addition to that, you're going to get to experience, I don't know, Wonder, mystery, laugh, laughter with friends, music that makes you cry, amazing foods, the thrill of watching some other person grow, all kinds of stuff. And then you think you don't have to pay some price? I think you should. The pay your price is death. death no, is none of us decide for ourselves to pay that price. Somebody else has to make the decision for us. And I think that that's a disgusting decision to make. I mean, the deal is I'm adopted. I, you I, I know. Do you want me to be angry with my biological mother? It has for nothing to no. I know. I know. Forgiveness is a big topic that comes up in this conversation for you. It's got no, you can yeah. But this doesn't have anything to do with being angry at anybody. You seem to think that it's oh, it's this God. the antinatalism is some sort of rage against the procreator. It can be, but it's not necessarily the case. I don't. I don't. I don't hate my parents. I think I think you're deeply wrong and you're doing it by definition. Again, you have this sort of boogeyman of the language you're using because you keep saying you're imposing and taking risks with other people. Whatnot. But if I, after having, and I'm adopted, after having met my biological mother and went, thank you, I'm grateful, even though it was a huge risk. I'm glad you feel that way, Corey. How well, many I'm, people in your same position would not be able to do that? How many people do you think if we would ask on the street and if we go to one by one and say, look, agreed, life is a bitch. Life is a lot of hardship, a lot of injustice. Yeah, I, I think most people would say, yeah, it's worth it. I really do, Corey, because, 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 because most people have no have never been exposed to any kind of conversation about any. Do, do, do you know how many people are afraid to say that life is, is what the cost of, of just saying that life is a negative is? Do you have any idea how many how, how many people are are? The, the the cultural um cost of of saying such a thing is tremendous for people people aren't at liberty to say these things or that they'd rather kill themselves you know what happens to most people if they say that they'd rather die 
we don't live in a world where we're where we're we're able to have this conversation. I mean, yeah, people like us that are you know either philosophers or deeply ingrained in this conversation, we've come to a point where we can say one way or the other. But most people haven't been exposed to these ideas or feel at liberty enough to express those ideas that are more in line with my side, if that is in fact what they think. I mean, I think there's something, you know, again, you know, sometimes it's like, like Freudian slips, you know, like the, 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 continu the continuous movement toward asymmetry, there's just something so suspicious about it because there's a kind of arrogant elitism nestled in the idea that other people are rubes, haven't really thought about it, but if they did, they'd somehow align with the position you're having. Well, they might, Corey. I'm not calling anybody a rube. I'm saying that they might. I'm saying that people haven't been exposed to this relevant information and that they might. I'm not saying that everybody would. There would be some you know, uh, omega point in the universe and of some sort of antinatalist awakening. I think it's a really important idea. I think it's a really, oh. really important idea that people consider the fact that perhaps imposing life is not a great hobby to have. I completely agree. Unwanted pregnancies are horrible. Like for so for your so, money, for, yeah. no, I'm just saying, for your money, see, like this, this is why I would call you again. You're, you're, co you're a tooth, uh, sorry, you're a comb with one tooth. It's like for you, there's really no distinction between the death of an 80 year old or five year old. For you, there really is just like none of those things matter, whether it's a, an unwanted pregnancy or wanted pregnancy, whether or not the child enters a loving home where there's people who there who's care, or if the child just born into an abusive family where they're beating the kid and, and basically raping the child. For you, those are just I, all- I, You're putting you're putting so many words in my mouth, Corey. It's, 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 slightly, I mean, it's slightly offensive, okay? Yeah, you, you, you don't, you don't, you, you, you've been, if for somebody that has been involved with this conversation for so long, I just feel like you don't, and I, and I would like to be able to make you understand that I don't know how, but I just don't think you understand this subject very well. I mean, help me. I, I'm trying, but I mean, I, I, I don't, it, 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 it's, you're, 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 you're calling me a, a comb with one tooth. Like I'm not seeing that, a, a, you know, a child in a bad circumstance is somehow not worse than a child in a good circumstance. Of course I do. They're equally imposed upon and it would have been better had them not been. That's it. Okay. Just Well, yeah. Well, then it, it doesn't matter. There's, your very reluctance to answer the question, the prompt about the 80-year-old versus the five-year-old. is They're the both incredibly tragic, okay? But the fact that the five-year-old had more life to live, I mean, it doesn't matter which way I answer this because you're going to say uh, the regular person would have answered it the way that I would answer it. That's what you basically have said. I'm saying- I don't know that, I don't think that my opinion would be I in alignment with theirs. No, I don't. They're both really tragic circumstances. I think it's an empirical question that one could raise and we could actually send out mailers and get that, a response to that question. And I think it would show how out of touch people are in the antinatalist community and what they would need to change in order to make their argument more persuasive. So That's what do you what, think that would be? What do you think that would be? It would have to be the change in the culture would have to be where people, when they hear that prompt, they go, phew, it's much better that that five-year-old died than the 80 year old because then they would say given that life was imposed upon them and given how much suffering they were they, they saved I, them I years. don't I don't think that an antinatalist would necessarily there's no there's no mandate that an antinatalist has to think it's good that a five-year-old died over an 80 year old it's ridiculous You're forced to make the decision of which is more tragic it wouldn't most, answer a question about antinatalism, most, fine, the five-year-old. Most people have- It's really a, bad when kids die. I don't know what you want me to say. Is, most people's, their intuitive sense, Amanda, is that what uh -huh. the person is going to be deprived of isn't hardship, loss, and suffering. What they're going to be deprived of is benefit, wonder, possible growth, explore, just the, knowing that this is at all. Well, the 80 year old can be deprived of those things too. Maybe they have a grandkid that they're no longer going to be able to engage oh, with and all that stuff. Oh, I mean, just all the information we have is their ages. That's all we have. Uh huh. I'm not going to go into these different details. Well, you, you seem to be saying that it's worse that the five year old is dead because they, that they don't have to live the rest of their life. Yeah, that would be, that would be really good. Uh, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's still, it's still not the subject of antinatalism, Corey. Oh, I'm not arguing that. I agree. I'm, I'm not trying to argue that it would be better. I'm my own sense. Well, is, I feel like it's the answer that you want from me, though, right? If you were going to be logically consistent, correct. 
no, but that's, <laughs> there's no mandate for antinatalists to think that. And it's not the subject of antinatalism. I keep telling you that. Well, it's, it's, par it's partly encumbered in you in order for you to buttress your claim that it would be better never to for have For the procreator not to make the decision for either person. People can't make the decision for themselves. There's no person there. Good. Then they should that it shouldn't be made in their in their place. So by your standard, no, no, I shouldn't. Yes, be nobody should be born. Humanity should go extinct and the rest of sentience. Yes, that's what we're that's the antinatalist argument. We're extinctionists. Yeah, I, <laughs> we're I, extinctionists, Corey. That's what we want. I'm not. I'm not at all. I know you're not. I've never said you were or thought for a second that you were. <laughs> It's quite clear that you aren't. Yeah, I mean, I'm for judicious decision making. I think not everyone right, should. Me too. I think some people, if they have love and resources and they are willing to be the kind of network that's there, right. they, that's a that's a they, better imposition than a worse one. Fine. That's okay. fantastic. Yeah. They are risking that person being unwilling to forgive them, but they're also risking that the person may say thank you because I couldn't have asked to be born, and so. I, why, why take why take the chance? Why take the chance that you're going to end up with somebody that's going to be in need of killing themselves? And when exactly are you going to let them do that? You're going to let the, a five year old do that? So let's 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 go back to that five year old. What if it's a five year old who already at that point says, "I don't want to live anymore." Are you going to let that five year old kill themselves? No, of course not. I, no, I of course you wouldn't. So 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 at what age are you going to finally let somebody exit after the decision has been made for them? I don't know, 21, 25, 18. It'd have to be yeah, some. I, I, I mean, why, why put somebody through 18 years of hell because you need the meaning of family? So well, no, but you see, now you're, you're reintroducing the logic. You said 18 years of. So in other words, like 18 years is worse Five than. Five years. Which is Any yet. amount of years that somebody can come to the conclusion that they were imposed upon. Why would you impose any amount of time? Five minutes, five years, 18 years, 80 years. Why would you impose any of it? Especially if you're dealing with a circumstance in which the person at any point in that amount of time, given whatever time we're talking about, wants well, to die. Well, again, the word risk makes it seem as if there is a way to come into life without risk. And that's just how life is. Life is risky, and that's just the deal. And I'm sorry that it's that way. I didn't choose it to be that way, but that's a fact of life, that life is risky. It has risk. But a risk, risk, again, is well, an It's also another fact of life that it's better if risks aren't taken. Risk is a noise that comes out of our mouth. That same circumstance that someone calls risk, another person could call opportunity. And so language slides around in right. big space. But both, but both possibilities are a dice that we, we roll in place of somebody else. So why, why do it at all? Why play that game? Because some people are very happy that they exist. But you can't have those happy people without the miserable people. You can't have one without the other. They both, they, neither experience exists within a vacuum. So, so maybe, so maybe those people, maybe the, maybe those good, maybe that good quality of life is not worth the amount of bad that you're imposing on the rest of everybody else. Do you think, here's a question for you. Do you think two people could have, say, arguably, different physical circumstances but have different senses of how miserable it is like it would be yes. possible yes. for some person to have i don't know be born with, maybe with a severe disability maybe in great poverty and maybe even with not a lot of family there with some people and somehow find life to be not that tyrannical and yes, someone else to be for example born into comfort and affluence and just have life be an absolute hell of course that's just a fact of death that's a fact Okay, so now don't you see how that introduces different dynamics and how we're assessing what life is? But you're still you st that because whatever opinion whatever individual comes to about their own experiences, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens with the existence of all of these other lives having other types of experiences, some of them incredibly negative at the same time. The procreation of the good lives does not happen without the procreation of the bad lives. Oh, see, I don't think of it that way. To me, no one has a good life and no one has a bad life. Well, Everyone is ambiguous. Everyone's life is ambiguous. Well, there you go again. <laughs> good old Professor Anton with his ambiguity. Everyone's life is a <laughs> mystic, Corey. 
that everyone's life is a mix of all kinds of hardship. And I would agree with that. And we all die and we don't have the right to die. Yes, it's and it's a, a really, really, really silly thing to take all of these chances and risks without consent and impose all of these possibilities on something that didn't ask for it. I mean, when you say impose on someone who didn't ask, an another way to say, uh, to frame and to speak words about that exact same situation is someone spoke on someone else's behalf, acting in what they thought that person would want them to do should yeah. the situation be reversed. And the person who makes the decision, the, the person who says, I need to abort, they may likely go, my life has sucked. It's been hardship. I'm not going to impose on another person. Somebody else, they go, oh my word, I am about to share with the person the greatest thing that there is, which is knowing that yeah. this is. You just keep on coming back to the, the opinions of the procreator, though. I understand that the procreator can see this in two different ways. We're talking about the procreatee. <laughs> This new person that you're going to impose upon, that's what really matters here. It's not the parents. <laughs> well, I know, but, you know, Benatar, here's the right language is no person is so lucky as to have never been. That is, that's the problem with your language of imposition. That's not Benatar's talk. No, it's not. In fact, well, that's a point that I was going to make with you today, that is, um, is that the, the imposition argument is actually a fairly rare argument in antinatalism. It was during our era of YouTube, actually, that it sort of had its, there is some academic talk yeah. procreation. I mean, I don't know if you've read Shonda Schifrin's paper on this subject, but 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 it really was on YouTube that the imposition argument yeah. came out. Well, it, it's not rigorous. Asymmetry is is fair enough, but the imposition it's it's already loaded language. I think Benatar was smart enough to avoid that. Well, I I, I don't know. Um, well, I'm I'm not really sure where we go from here, Corey. Um, I mean, I, I I've prepared quite a lot of questions, but I don't I really don't even know what we've addressed and not addressed. Um, this has yeah. been very interesting. I mean, I no, I'm interested in things like you know, for me. I would be more interested in, like I say, right to die. Or on the other hand, yeah. I'm much interested in having the question and argument about getting people to adopt and to realize that somebody had an unwanted pregnancy uh -huh. and religious dogma or some other reason they put their child. They now that's really taking a risk. To all, risk all important subjects, not the subject of antinatalism. This is where the line becomes. You know, like it's one thing to say, you know, don't even allow the person in, like. Because that that's just an imposition. But if you say, you know, I'm going to give the child up for adoption, I think many people, you know, to be pro adoption, to to try to change the culture's orientation away from the if it's not mine, I don't care about it. Yeah, to, sure, of course. That's a more yeah. that, that's going to be an easier, and it's still a very very difficult argument. But that's yes, a, it is, and that's one that I think is important because people have sure. been harmed. Sure, existence. But yeah. they can much harm so much more significantly by neglect and by lack of care. So a lot yeah. of it, it's not just that life is hard. It's that we as humans make it unnecessarily harder than it has to be. We do do that, certainly. And I'm, I'm of course, very pro-adoption. That's that's a, a very important thing in, in the world. I mean, and, you know, there's there's all kinds of other aspects to this. Like we think we have to procreate so that somebody will take care of us when we're old. And that's a, that's a myth. You know, how many people are in nursing homes right now, you know, with lots and lots of kids, but nobody comes and visits them. So there's all kinds. Yes, there's all kinds of other other conversations around the subject of procreation that are very important to have. Yeah. None of those, however, are the subject of antinatalism. So. <laughs> How about if I, if I, I mean, we're, we're, you're, I'm sure your time is limited. And how about if I give you a, 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 a story that I would suggest that may be useful to the antinatalist community? Okay, okay. It would be interesting to have someone, and they have to, you need somebody who's really good at writing, who could compose it and really give it a per, persuasive way. Like a, okay. a sort of macabre short story about like a radical right-wing pro-lifer who... Uh, you know, is, is struggling with their pro-life position and then they they get pregnant and it's an unwanted pregnancy and they, they're not sure what to do and they end up having the child and and it's unwanted and they're not in a position to take care of it. So they take the good Lord's advice and they give it up for adoption. That, and this is a 
devoutly religious person. They pray every day. They're praying for the soul and all this kind of stuff. But this kid gets kicked in and out of foster care. This kid gets run over, has abusive parent after abusive parent, turns to criminality, turns to drugs, turns to all kinds of other criminal behavior, ends up in detention, forms of, you know, a, abusive prison system, and then eventually hangs themselves. And now they have to spend all eternity in hell because the pro-lifer in their interest of saving a soul and wanting to, because they believe that life begins at uh, conception. Now what they really did was in giving birth, they sentenced not someone just to a life of suffering an ambiguous game, but death in the end, but they sentenced them to life eternal in hell. I think that would be a good antinatal. So I think that would be one maybe sobering for some of the pro-life folks out there. Well, I think it'd be interesting how much Christian antinatalism cross there. You know, Kierkegaard was a basically a Christian antinatalist. So there is actually more crossover there than you might think. Um, but that sounds interesting. Yeah, certainly. You, you're, you're, you're gonna Soren Kierkegaard. You're gonna claim right now as an antinatalist. Yeah. Have you ever? I'll I can send you some quotes after this. Yeah, he was a proto antinatalist. Yeah, long did. before, long before David. Well, in the same vein as Emil Charon, one of your favorite authors, he was a proto antinatalist. I got a dozen Kierkegaard books right now on my shelf. This that no, that's that, that's absurd. I, I will send you the quotes. I assure you, I don't have them. I, if you'd like, I look it up now, and we can, I can read them out to you. Jesus, Jesus was an antinatalist. In the book of the Egyptians, Jesus says, "As long as women continue to give birth, suffering will continue." Yeah, I mean, the yeah. Calvary Christ Christianity, yeah. antinatalism, yeah. Christianity. Well, I mean, so, but those are those are like glib. Those are again glib lines out of context of some person having a thought. These no. are. People created ambiguity they have just Kierkegaard, as Kierkegaard argued that the church had uh lost its way basically by becoming pro-life that basically the early Christians were uh like essentially extinctionists that hated sex and hated procreation and that was so for Kierkegaard the only two games in town are pro-life and antinatalism no, I I don't know. I but I I'm saying that he made very antinatalist arguments. If you'd like, I can I'd be happy to share those quotes with you. It's not antinatalism as we understand it today. Certainly not. He's got the master. He voiced a very he voiced a very pro antinatalist position. These guys were masters of ambiguity, and they thought a lot of different things. And I mean, he wrote under different pseudonyms. You know, he, he was a very very complicated person. Died at a tragic young age. Anyway, I don't want to keep you. I think that, yes, there are strains of antinatalistic thought within countless thinkers of philosophy. But this school of antinatalism that uses words like imposition and risk and other kinds of loaded words, I think it's never going to make traction. Unfortunately, it's not going to make the traction that people would like, partly because it's not in line with the way people actually experience it. I don't think anyone has a horrible life and other people have a great life. Everyone's life is a mix of all kinds of different pains and, and cruelties and, and, you know, just and, suffering, all kinds of stuff. And I think, it, like I say, I mean, I would just, we've said it a million times in this talk. I think if you could reverse people's sensibilities, like as, as the world gets worse and worse and as they're like, you know, just horrors in the world to the point where people are convinced that it's much better for the death of a young person than an old person, then I think antinatalism is a much easier sell. Okay, well, I mean, I, I just want to say that I, I have, I've never said that it's one or the other. I have always said, and many antinatalists before me that have talked to you have said that life is a whole huge pile of varied experiences. So I'm not actually thinking in those kinds of black and white terms about it. What I'm saying is that the risk of the bad is not worth imposing for the sake of all of this meaning or, or enjoyment or enjoying a piece of music or all of these other things. We can do that without harming future. Uh, we can, we can do that without harming our children is so the argument we, by we, creating them. Yeah. How about this quick question here? So we get together a hundred uh, 80 year old people and we ask them to look back upon their lives and say, you know, in some, would you do it again? Was it bad? Was it good? And we get a split. Some people are like, it was a horrible, I wish I could have never been. Other people are like, oh, it was pretty good. This whole kind of thing. How would we know of those who are rationalizing versus those who really did have it 
I quote, better than not good. Well, we, 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 we wouldn't, and I don't know if that, those kinds of, the survey material that you keep bringing up is really, is really what we are after here. I mean, we're, we're, ta- we're, we're asking people to say one way or the other again with, I mean, you, you know, you're, you're an educator, right? Like people that have not been exposed to these ideas at any point in their life have no, um, uh, comfort level with saying, uh, the negative in many circumstances. I just don't know that, um, you know, after, after what, what, what would they say? Let's put it this way. What would that same section of people that we have put together necessarily say after a debate? Maybe they've, maybe they've watched this video or maybe they've watched a debate on antinatalism or something like that. And perhaps that would be interesting to see how they would answer then. But yeah. we're, we're talking about an idea that is very, in many, many ways, very new in the world. And I don't know if antinatalism is defeated by just, whatever a survey of regular well, people right well, now would say or not say in response. The world is very diverse. It's got a lot of different kinds of people, especially around the globe. And I would say if we would ask everybody, you're going to get probably the bulk of people that are probably more going to be pro-choice than they are pro-life, and you're going to get a tiny little portion that are going, eh, maybe a, not not equal uh, to. Well, my is, argument is not that antinatalism is winning. Well, <laughs> so the, the the kind of arrogance or the elitism in the assumption that if people simply thought about it more or heard about this, they would change. I think maybe some pro-lifers. I'm not sure how many pro-choicers. You're going to sway because I think a lot of pro-choicers, they've had to make a lot of very difficult decisions about it already. Pro-lifers are generally dogmatically adhering to what they've been taught and, you know, they're adhering to fear of afterlife and all this kind of other stuff. Other people who are pro-choice, I think many times they've already had children and then they've had to make tough choices to sort of family plan. So they've thought a lot about it. Well, I mean, look, all I can do is keep making the argument, right? This is the 72nd okay. episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. I've been at this for 12 years. I will go until the end of my days and we'll, you know, it's not up to me, certainly. But well, um, yeah, all yeah. I can do is keep, all I can do is keep trying because mm-hmm. I do think it's wrong to impose need for no need. And I think that it's wrong to impose and take risks with people, you know, beings that didn't, were unable to give prior consent. Well, again, I, I commend you, Amanda. I appreciate you having you know having me on, and I would say you know keep keep up the good work, keep up the fight. You know, I think there are people who are very glib about having babies and children, and the, you know the pro lifers I think need to be sobered. Are there pro choicers who do? Yeah, maybe. Uh, I I think there are some issues that you would need to address. And, and to tackle in order to get that message more effectively across. And I think it is about accepting that some people just aren't going to agree over the the degree to which you can sort of even weigh it out. Yeah. You know? And and I, and I accept that. I accept that. Um, but, you know, I mean, we, we certainly, um, we certainly create, you know, rules around things that are found to have a significant amount of harm and that's you know we 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 came to understand that slavery caused an incredible amount of harm and i think that procreation can does have the potentiality to eventually be one of those things that we can evolve to understand is an incredible source of harm creation and so whether people agree i think they can be prevented okay can i say one last thing okay maybe this is maybe Absolutely. And this is where I get sort of creeped out by some of the connection to Kierkegaard at the end, because I guess I would say that it's scary for me to think that in the the reluctance to talk about the differences of how long you're alive and is it better or worse, and to really focus on, no, the blanket move of antinatalism is just don't bring any more life into existence. That, to me, unfortunately... This is a whole nother can of worms that we cannot touch. But the indefinite life extension stuff, I am against. I am against. Oh, I, I'm not for any of that either. I'm not a transhumanist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's both yeah. the kind of evils that humans do. These are the things that. So, I mean, I think I want to be careful in in laying out the position so strictly aligned with the only criteria is not having any more people be born. I could hear some, yeah, transhumanists foaming at the mouth going, yeah, that's right. We don't want any more people because I want to live to be a thousand. Yeah, it gives me the creeps. 
Well, it's interesting. You know, there is a, you know, I don't know if you know who David Pierce is. He's one of the premier transhumanists. He is also an antinatalist. That is a kind of an interesting confluence. But uh, but yeah, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly not for life extension. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, interestingly enough, though, if people did gain immortality, you probably would have to have some pretty strict rules against procreation because you can't really can't really keep making new people in a in a world in a, on a on a planet with finite resources in which people live forever. Yes, yeah, strange the fellows, very good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, Corey, thank you so much. It really, I mean, I, I've I've wanted to talk to you for a really long time, and I appreciate your time. I really didn't mean for this to get a bit, uh, however it got. What, what was that really the interview I had in mind? But I do appreciate your time, and uh, congratulations on how non being on being. It's it's wonderful Perfect. to see you again. Thanks. I mean, I think it was heated, but I think it was more like pro wrestling. I think it was sure. sensation for you know for sensationalizing this stuff. I have I have the slightest bit of ill will towards no, you. No, and I don't either. I've always liked you tremendously. I that 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 has not changed in any way, shape, or form. I hope to speak with you again at some point. And uh, thank you for being my guest today on exploring antinatalism. Okay. All right. Take good care, Corey. Bye bye. Yeah. Please visit Professor Anton at professoranton.wordpress.com, subscribe to him on YouTube, and check out his books including his latest How Non-Being Haunts Being on Amazon. Links below! And don't forget about me, the star of Mechanized, a miniseries featuring antinatalist philosopher, Marty Harry and antinatalist activist, Amanda Supnik, as they challenge the open AI chatbot to answer their questions about antinatalism, only to receive the most interesting answers. Don't miss the premiere of the final episode of this season of Mechanized on February 15th, when Marty and Amanda will finally reveal their big secret project. The new adventure premieres March 15th. In the meantime, Mechanized and I will soon be taking a nap for a little while, but never fear, we will be back. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Exploring Antinatalism can also be heard on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Buzzsprout, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Amazon.com, and so many other platforms. You can email me at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. Website designed by Visions Noirs. Please follow him at www.bionoir.com and follow him on Instagram. Logo art by Life Sucks. Please subscribe to him on YouTube and check out his shop on Etsy at www.etsy.com slash shop slash Life Sucks Publishing. Music by Mati Hairi. You can hear the whole song, Life is a Sexually Transmitted Disease with a Mortality Rate of 100% by following the link in the description. And make sure to also read his academic paper, which inspired the song, If You Must Give Them a Gift, Then Give Them the Gift of Non-Existence, in the Cambridge Quarterly of Healthcare Ethics on cambridge.org. Links below. All the best, and bye for now. Life is no thrill It's worse than meal So draw the right conclusion Let there be still